Hi, everyone. Welcome to the last uh, uh, session of our workshop and to the last uh, keynote, talk in, keynote talk in this case. And it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Piotr Indik, who is a professor at MIT. Um, so Piotr uh, has a number of awards, including Paris Kanilakis Award. Uh, he also worked on uh, worked very prolifically on like many different areas, including uh, computational high-dimensional geometry, data mining, uh, streaming algorithms, signal processing, sparse Fourier transform, uh, fine-grained computational complexity. Uh, but most recently, he has become interested in uh, learning-based algorithms, and that's what he's going to talk today about. Uh, let's welcome Piotr. Thank you. Right. Uh, hello, everyone. Can you hear me well? Yeah? All right. OK. Uh, so thanks for uh, coming, and uh, thanks for the organizers for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here. It's actually my second time at uh, Microsoft uh, Research. Uh, the first time was uh, in 2000, uh, when I was interviewing for a job uh, in the data mining group. Uh, so uh, there has been uh, lots of changes uh, since then. I think that all of you guys were in a different building and so on. Uh, yeah, it was a long time ago. Uh, so uh, in this talk, uh, I would like to give an overview that um, uh, several people, including myself, and uh, when I say several people, I mean uh, uh, these fine folks, uh, have been uh, uh, pursuing uh, over the last few years. Uh, and this is a research focused on uh, using machine learning to improve algorithms. Right, so not necessarily machine learning to solve uh, you know, AI problem, computer vision, and so on, but uh, on using machine learning problem to uh, improve uh, classic algorithms along the lines that uh, uh, we often see in the basic introductory uh, algorithms courses. And uh, as I mentioned, you know, this is a joint work with uh, uh, several people, Anders Amanch and uh, Yu Su, uh, Dina Katabi, Yang uh, Yuan, and Ali Vakrian. Uh, this work, like all those people, have been at MIT, where this uh, work was happening. Uh, since then, uh, Anders went back to Denmark, and uh, Yang uh, went to China uh, to start as a tenure-track professor at uh, Tsinghua University. All right, so, uh, uh, so here is the, I would say, one slide uh, overview uh, of this talk. And uh, I have an easy job because uh, Nina was talking about uh, you know, very close related topics uh, just uh, yesterday. Uh, but uh, just for the recap, uh, here is uh, you know, the basic idea. So the starting point uh, of, uh, you know, like the starting point of all of this are uh, classic algorithms. Right, so these are the classic algorithms that uh, many people in this room, uh, including myself, uh, Alex, and uh, many other people are uh, working on. And uh, uh, these are the algorithms that uh, you know we teach in uh, uh, algorithms courses. You know that they are, you know, uh, uh, they populate a uh, standard textbook and so on, like CRS and so on. And uh, the distinguishing feature uh, of those algorithms is that uh, they have uh, worst-case guarantees. Right, so uh, those algorithms, you know, have to be provably correct. Uh, if they're approximate algorithms, you know, we have to have uh, a provable guarantees on the approximation ratio. You know, typically we also have, uh, uh, you know, worst case guarantees on the running time and so on. And uh, needless to say, I mean, you know, these are, you know, algorithms are very useful. Like, uh, you know, this is like an underestimation statement. Uh, however, uh, over time, you know, people realize that uh, uh, worst case approach to algorithm design has some issues. And uh, in particular, you know, like from the perspective of this talk, the key issue is that uh, uh, if you design algorithms for the worst case, often those algorithms have a limited adaptivity to inputs, right? Because uh, what often happens is that, uh, you know, in applications, not all inputs are created equal, right? Like some inputs, you know, uh, you know appear to be simpler, you know, to solve, while some others are, you know, harder. Right? And uh, you know, worst case guarantees, uh, you know, by definition, tune the algorithm for the worst case. And uh, not always, but often, uh, you know, as a result of this, they don't uh, exploit uh, uh, you know, easiness of hardness of uh, uh, input data. So there have been uh, lots of uh, approaches. I mean, this is not a new issue, right? I mean, the, this issue has been recognized for the last few decades, and uh, there are a variety of uh, approaches to it. Uh, team of Garden had a very nice recent survey about uh, beyond worst case, right? About uh, various approaches, you know, like smooth analysis and, and, and so on. Uh, in this talk, uh, I will focus on uh, one particular approach, uh, which uh, you know uh, one can dub uh, uh, machine learning uh, based approach. And uh, 
you know, here is uh, you know, the idea is to view this uh, problem of algorithm design as a, as a machine learning problem. Right? So in the, in the extreme case, you, know, you could think about an uh, uh, algorithm you know, as solving some <coughs> uh, computational problem, which is a function. Right? So this function has some inputs, it has some outputs. So you can sample the inputs, uh, train, say, neural network on those inputs, and then uh, you know, get a, a solution to your computational problem. Right? And uh, this approach, uh, you know, that there are many, many aspects of this approach. I will over, overview some of them in the next slide. Uh, this approach works surprisingly well, right? So for, for many problems, you can actually get a better algorithmic performance, right? Measure as uh, time, approximation, and so on, you know, essentially by using uh, uh, this type of approach, right? But uh, unfortunately, in the extreme, it uh, you know, comes with a fundamental drawback. Namely, you know, it doesn't come with uh, worst-case guarantees, and not necessarily on the running time, but even correctness. Right? I mean, uh, you know, if you feed, uh, and by the way, I don't mean uh, no worst-case guarantees on the learning problem itself. I mean, uh, learn, I mean worst-case guarantees on the algorithmic problem solved using uh, machine learning. Right? You know, because you know, if, you, if you train your data on some distribution and then you try to query it with some, you try to run your algorithm on different distribution, you know, like who knows what, what, what will happen. Right? You, you have very little control uh, in many situations over, over the outcome. So ideally, uh, one would like to have the, the best of both worlds. Right? That uh, on the one hand, you retain you know, the power of machine learning, right? which allows you to adapt to easiness of hardness of uh, particular inputs or a uh, hardness or, or uh, classes of inputs. But uh, at the same time, we'd like to have uh, some sort of a control uh, over uh, what is happening, right? In particular, you know, for one, you would like to have guarantees about correctness, right? You know, correctness, you know, your algorithm should be correct, right? And, uh, you know, hopefully you should also have some control over uh, running time and, uh, and other parameters. Uh, so this is uh, the class of uh, algorithms uh, that uh, I will focus on uh, uh, in uh, this talk. All right, so as I mentioned, uh, you know, there has been a uh, lot of uh, uh, research along these lines over the last few years. And uh, here is an uh, uh, overview slide, right? It's a, it's a very rough overview slide, and uh, I apologize in advance for, uh, you know, work that, uh, you know, to people whose work should be here, but, uh, you know, like I, uh, I, I forgot, you know, please definitely let me know. Uh, but uh, you know, to the best of my knowledge, uh, the work in this space can be roughly divided into uh, four uh, classes. Right? So perhaps the, the first, like the first to my knowledge, uh, example of uh, this type of approach to algorithm design uh, came from the, uh, as uh, uh, often referred to as an uh, algorithm configuration. Right, so here the idea is that uh, you know you have an algorithm. It's a well-behaving algorithm, you know, correct and so on. But uh, it has a bunch of knobs, right? You know that, that there are some parameters. You know, like you can think simplex, for example, right? You know, simplex, you know, optimization algorithm. But that has many knobs that you can tune, right? You can think about hyperparameters in the ML uh, lingo, and uh, you can use machine learning in order to uh, to optimize those parameters to a particular instance or a particular class of instances. Right, so there has been a, a work in this space for, uh, for a while. And uh, you know, recently, uh, Rishi Gupta, Timur of Garden, and uh, uh, Nina Balkan you know, gave uh, theoretical foundations to, uh, you know, to this uh, line of, of research, right, using uh, pack learning and so on. So this is uh, one uh, kind of uh, algorithmic design approach to this, uh, 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 to this problem. Uh, over the last few years, though, there have been uh, many other uh, algorithmic techniques. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, like a, a rough classification of those, right? So another approach uh, of uh, incorporating machine learning in algorithms is uh, something that one can call the uh, ML oracles, right? So an ML oracle is like a little birdie that uh, you can ask uh, questions when you, as an algorithm, are not sure what to do. Right, so this is uh, particularly useful in online algorithms, right? Where in online algorithms, the whole point is that uh, you don't know the future, right? But uh, you know, you might have some guesses uh, about the future if you ask the little birdie, right? Uh, so, so these uh, approaches have been uh, incorporated in uh, a few recent papers, and. Uh, uh, it also turns out to be useful for uh, data structures, you know, branch and bound uh, search techniques, and and so on. Another uh, type of approach is uh, something that uh, one can call the uh, learned structures, 
Uh, so this was actually my entry point uh, to this field. Uh, so here the idea is that uh, you know, the whole algorithm is uh, essentially based on a one mathematical structure, like, like a matrix, for example, right? or, a, or a mapping uh, of some sort. And uh, typically, these uh, mappings uh, or structures are generated random. Right? But uh, you know, instead of random, you can just learn it. Right? And uh, you know, here there's been a very long line of research uh, under the banner of uh, learning to hash, you know, starting from the work by Hinton, Salah, Salah Kudinov. And uh, more recently, it has been deployed in an uh, uh, area of compressive sensing by, the, uh, by this uh, folks. Uh, the last uh, uh, algorithmic approach that I'm aware of is uh, something that one can call end-to-end. Okay, so this is, you know, you basically sample the inputs, you know, run your neural network, and uh, hope for the best, right? And this, uh, this approach, uh, you know, has been uh, also very popular uh, recently, and uh, especially in the context of uh, optimization algorithms, right? So it has been uh, applied pretty successfully to, to, to problems like, you know, scheduling and uh, various combinatorial problems and so on. Okay, so this is, a, I would say, like a one-slide uh, overview uh, of, uh, uh, you know, different aspects of uh, using ML in an algorithm. And, you know, again, I apologize, uh, you know, if I missed any relevant works. You know, definitely I would appreciate uh, feedback at the end. Uh, any questions so far? All right. So in this talk, uh, uh, that I will give uh, two examples of uh, using uh, machine learning uh, to improve algorithms. And... Uh, these examples will fall into uh, one example will fall into this class, and one will fall um, into this class. Somehow, uh -huh. the difference between one and three seems to be like very, very fuzzy. Algorithm configuration and learn structures. Uh, between one and three. Uh, well, it's fu it's fuzzy because you know it's a, it's not a formal classification, right? You know, like, you know, have a divide and conquer and uh, dynamic programming, right? I mean, yeah, but even informally yeah. somehow, like... So again? Even informally, it feels like... Oh, I see, informally. Like, well, informally, the idea, uh, it's, it's mostly about the numbers, right? You know, so here, the, uh, at least the, the original motivation was to, say, you know, tune maybe 80 or 100 parameters of CPLEX, right? So, so you really have knobs, right? You can imagine, like, listing all these knobs and, and tuning them, right? On the other hand, in this case, uh, I mean, the size of the structure is uh, comparable to the size of the input, right? So, you know, you can <clears throat> easily have, uh, you know, one, one billion nodes, right? Uh, but yes, I, I agree that, uh, you know, this is, this is not a formal uh, distinction, but uh, at least uh, this distinction has been helpful to me, right, in understanding what's, uh, what's happening. All right. Uh, uh, any questions so far? All right. All right. So in this talk, uh, I will focus on uh, uh, learn a learning-based approach to one particular method for uh, algorithm design, which is uh, uh, so-called uh, linear sketches. Uh, let me just uh, take a quick poll. How many people have heard about linear sketching before? Okay. Thanks. All right. So for the you know half of the folks who haven't seen it, this is a very quick uh, overview. So uh, linear sketching is uh, uh, an approach uh, to uh, algorithm design. And uh, uh, it works where the input can be represented either explicitly or uh, implicitly by either a vector or, or a matrix. Right? So it's a you know, it's pretty, pretty common case. And uh, the first step that you uh, do uh, in a linear sketching is you, you take your input and compress it by multiplying it by some uh, matrix. Uh, this is supposed to be a fat matrix, right? So it's supposed to have uh, more uh, columns than rows, right? Which means that uh, uh, you know, the dimension of uh, Sx is uh, shorter than the dimension of x, right? So you basically compress the input. And then once you do it, uh, you perform the computation on the sketch as opposed to uh, on the original uh, input, right? So you know, the potential benefit is obvious, right? You operate on a smaller dimensional uh, input. Uh, of course, the sum mapping uh, introduces some error, right? So the, all of these algorithms are, are always approximate. And now over the last uh, uh, couple of decades, uh, this approach has been uh, very useful uh, in, uh, uh, for designing a variety of algorithms. 
you know, to the best of my knowledge, perhaps the, the first uh, uh, approach of this type uh, is uh, through uh, randomized uh, dimensional reduction, right? So, you know, tools like Johnson Leadership, Lemma, and so on, which you know, essentially tells you that. Uh, you know, if you are okay with a wall plus epsilon approximation, you can just take your high dimensional vector, project it down, and then operate on the projected version. Right? So this has been very useful for uh, lots of things, you know, similarity search, uh, uh, linear algebra problems, and so on. Uh, another class of uh, 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 algorithms uh, uh, for which this uh, approach uh, has been useful are streaming algorithms. Right, so here in streaming algorithms, you have a long stream, which you can implicitly represent as a high dimensional vector. And then sketch reduces the size of this vector so that you can actually store. Right, so so there, are, there are many uh, streaming algorithms developed over the last couple of decades which have followed this approach. Uh, perhaps the most prominent example of this approach is our sensing, uh, where you know, the sketching is uh, incorporated directly into the hardware design. Right, so you take a photo, you know, or, or send, send something, you know, the hardware automatically computes a sketch of your image, right, so that you have something shorter, and uh, this reduces the acquisition time. And once you have the sketch, you can run uh, software, you know, randomization and so on, to, to try to recover the original uh, size, the original uh, input. And uh, last but not least, uh, uh, sketching has been also very used in uh, linear algebra, right? So for especially over the last uh, ten years or so. Uh, you know, some of the most efficient algorithms for uh, regression, low rank approximation, you know, ridge regression, and so on, have been obtained using sketching. All right, so, uh, you know, uh, this slide, you know, uh, shows that linear sketching is useful. So the question is, uh, you know, can we uh, use uh, learning, right, to improve sketching uh, algorithms? And, uh, uh, you know, there are potentially many approaches, but uh, a very natural approach is uh, to try to learn the matrix, right? Because uh, in most, not all, but uh, most uh, sketching, linear sketching algorithms, you know, you, you, you do sketching using a random matrix. I mean, you know, there are many different matrices, you know, sparse, dense, subsample, the Hadamard uh, transform, uh, fast Johnson Leadership transform, and so on, but uh, they are typically random. Um, and there is a reason why they are random, right? I mean, it's very easy to generate a random matrix. Often, you can multiply uh, vectors by this matrix efficiently. You know, for example, if there are sparse. And uh, thanks to various concentration equalities, uh, you can often get worst case guarantees, right? So you, you get a control over the approximation factor. However, you know, uh, it comes with a disadvantage, right? You know, random matrices by, by very definition don't adapt to the data, right? I mean, they are random. Right? In fact, you generate those matrices without even seeing the data, right? So with the oblivious in the, in the strongest sense. All right, so a natural idea is to not generate those matrices randomly, but uh, to learn them uh, from uh, examples. And this is uh, uh, certainly not a new idea. Uh, so for example, in the context of a uh, damage to reduction, I mean, people have been using uh, you know, adaptive damage to reduction way before they used random damage to reduction, right? I mean, you know, PCA, isomap, and, and I was talking about uh, isomap uh, yesterday, right? Uh, uh, that said, uh, you know, to the best of my knowledge, this type of techniques are typically generic, and they are not designed for a particular algorithmic purpose, right? And, and often, they probably don't work. Uh, right? So, for example, if you try to do uh, nearest neighbor search, right? You know, one can often one can do, uh, you know, say PCA, right, to reduce dimension. But uh, you know, PCA preserves the global structure, uh, while in uh, similarity search you care about neighborhoods, right? Because you care about the preservation of the distances from points uh, to the nearest neighbor, right? So the, the objective of PCA is that odds uh, to what you actually want to preserve, right? Uh, so, you know, so this means that, you know, if you want to use uh, this type of techniques for algorithmic problems, you know, you have to really tailor, uh, you, you have to design those uh, reduction with uh, particular algorithmic tools uh, in mind. Question. Yes? Your matrices are over R, uh, between 0, 1 to the N, Boolean. Oh, I see. Uh, right. So, uh, 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 yes, so they are over R. Uh, How do you choose random matrix over R? It's not well defined. Uh, right, so there are many ways of uh, doing it, right? Like I didn't want to get into details, right? Because uh, there are many options, but you can think random Gaussian. Like each entry is independent uh, uh, Gaussian. Uh, you can also take uh, random signs, 
right, plus minus one. So you can take sparse matrices like that where, you know, they are mostly zero, but as a random uh, signs every now and then. So are these some of the knobs you want to uh, adjust? That's correct. How you choose the matrix? Or uh, you, now, how you do always you look at uh, a matrix of particular type? Uh, so in this work, I will look at matrix of a particular type. Uh, in fact, this, uh, <laughs> this type is going to be sparse matrices, right? Uh, the knobs, uh, the many knobs that I will adjust are the values of the cell matrices. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Uh, any other questions? All right. All right, so, uh, so, the, uh, so we would like to learn this as sketching in the context of a particular algorithmic application, in particular to ensure some sort of a correctness or approximation guarantee. And uh, here, to the best of my knowledge, the research has been my sparser. And again, you know, if I'm missing something, you know, definitely please let me know. But uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, the first uh, uh, results of this type have been obtained by Ali Musavi and uh, you know, the rest of the Rich Baranya group in the context of our compressed sensing, right? Uh, so, uh, in particular, they uh, pointed out a very nice connection between compressed sensing and uh, autoencoders, right? You know, in autoencoders, you know, you have the input, you compress it into something smaller, and then you recover it, right? So, the objective of compressing sensing is very similar, and uh, they use this uh, connection to uh, basically show how you can train this uh, linear mapping S uh, using machine learning uh, type of techniques. Uh -huh. They do autoencoders without nonlinearity, so they just train. Uh, you can do them without nonlinearities because you, you can just design the architecture of your uh, autoencoder uh, so that uh, uh, basically this is the first uh, layer of weights, uh, right? So uh, uh, you know this is the, the 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 second layer of the hidden units, right? And then the rest is a uh, uh, you know decoder, right? Uh, so, the, you know, so this is, uh, to the best of my knowledge, the uh, first uh, uh, type of uh, work on this topic. Uh, but, you know, as we have seen, sketching are useful for many algorithmic problems. So, uh, you know, the question that, uh, you know, we ask ourselves is, uh, you know, can you improve uh, streaming algorithms or linear algebra uh, algorithms and, and so on using, uh, you know, this uh, lens sketches approach. Right. In the rest of the stock, uh, assuming time permits, uh, I will give you, uh, you know, example answers to uh, both of these two questions. Right. So I will give an example of a streaming algorithm that uh, uses learning uh, to improve the sketches and uh, a linear algebra algorithm particular for a low rank approximation. Then again, uses uh, learn sketches. All right. So uh, let's start from the streaming. Algorithms. <clears throat> All right. So the problem uh, that uh, we focused on is a so-called uh, frequency estimation problem. Uh, this problem, its variants are, are known after many names. You know, heavy heater is, is another variant uh, of it. So it's a streaming problem, right? So here the idea is that uh, you have a stream of uh, data, right? You know, integers, for uh, for example. And uh, the algorithm is uh, allowed uh, to make a uh, one pass uh, over the input. And the uh, goal is that uh, at the end of the stream, where the algorithm makes this uh, a pass, then this algorithm has to uh, be able to give an estimation of a frequency of any element. Right? So these elements are from some universe U. So at the end of the stream, the algorithm uh, is uh, given uh, you know, an item index. And uh, it's uh, supposed to output an estimation of the uh, number of times this element occurs uh, in the stream. Right? So, so this is a you know, pictorial representation of the functionality that uh, the streaming algorithm has to provide after reading uh, the input. Okay? Uh, so this is a you know, useful problem in many applications. Right? Uh, I mean, counting, generally speaking, is useful. Right? I mean, uh, you know, arithmetic, right? Uh, so uh, the classic uh, motivation for this is our network measurements, right? You know, packets for the network, you want to basically count them to figure out what's happening. Uh, in Combio, you know, people count k-mers, right? So to understand uh, the structure of, a, of a, a genetic sequences, you know, it's useful in machine learning and, and other applications. Uh, 
Now, of course, you know, if you look at this problem, it's uh, super easy uh, if you have enough space, right? Because all you do, you see an element, you increment the corresponding entry. But uh, once you uh, start dealing with a massive data, you want to use super su sublinear space, right? Uh, and uh, then the problem becomes uh, much more interesting. And uh, uh, there are many solutions uh, to this problem that uh, use uh, sublinear space. Approximate solutions to this problem that use uh, sublinear space uh, developed um, over the last uh, two decades uh, or so. And uh, in this talk, I will focus on one, two examples. Uh, the first one is a so-called uh, countmin algorithm. How many of you have seen countmin? Okay. All right, so I'm just going to do a very quick overview. Right? This is a count mean uh, in a nutshell. Right? The basic algorithm uh, essentially just uh, takes this uh, whole universe of elements and uh, hashes it into a smaller universe, which can be stored uh, directly. Right? So you prepare this uh, random hash function. Uh, now, you, know, you typically don't actually have a random hash function. You use some pseudo-random hash function right, to, to be able to store it. And uh, you uh, maintain counters for the uh, hashed uh, array uh, such that uh, you know, each entry contains the sum of the frequencies that are mapped to this uh, entry. Right? So it's a very easy to uh, uh, maintain it. Right? Anytime you see an element, you just uh, hash it, increment the entry. In order to estimate the frequency of the element, you know, again, you take the element, hash it, and you return the value of this counter. Right, so this is uh, essentially the whole algorithm. Uh, I'm saying essentially is because uh, you know typically you don't have just a one hash table and uh, you have several hash tables, right? And and then you combine these uh, estimators using the minimum estimator. But you know from the perspective of this talk, I'm just going to skip that. Part. So this algorithm uh, has a bunch of uh, nice properties. Uh, for one, it works with uh, both insertions and deletions, right? You know, insertions increments, deletions decrement. Right, so so it's a, it's a very flexible algorithm. It also has the nice property that it never uh, underestimates, right? Because uh, you know stuff hashes to this entry. Uh, uh, now, if something else uh, hashes to this entry, uh, this uh, uh, in, uh, introduces noise, but uh, the noise is only positive, right? So you you never underestimate, which uh, also has a, a nice pro uh, nice property. So uh, it's a widely used, uh, used algorithm, uh, but it's not the only one uh, in this space. And uh, another quite similar algorithm uh, is a so-called account sketch. And here the main difference is that uh, arrows have signs. Right? So you consistently multiply uh, each frequency by a sign, which means that when you add uh, those frequencies up, you know, arrows can cancel out, because they are not all positives. You know, they are pluses and minuses. Right, so you know, uh, count sketch typically has a smaller error, but uh, it doesn't have, you know, for example, this property. Right, so depending on the situation, people use one uh, or the other. All right, so this is the standard count sketch uh, or count mean. Uh, so let's see how we can try to use machine learning to improve uh, the performance of uh, this algorithm. But uh, before we do it, it's uh, uh, perhaps helpful to just uh, do a uh, like a mental check and see. Like, do we expect uh, machine learning to, to find some structure that we can exploit, right? Like, for example, if uh, uh, this, uh, you know, if the, if the stream is just a bunch of random numbers, you know, they don't have structure, right? So presumably, we are not going to improve anything uh, if we just have a stream of random numbers, right? So, so it's good to have some mental check, uh, you know, whether in the typical data that people use this algorithm for, you know, whether there is some structure that uh, potentially can be exploited. And you know, like if you think about it for a minute or two, you know, it's uh, clear that at least in principle there is a structure that uh, comes from the ID of, of uh, stream elements in many applications, right? So for example, for word data, uh, it's known that uh, longer words uh, occur less frequently. Right? So just by uh, looking at the length of the word, you know, we can have some uh, noisy prediction of whether uh, you know element is uh, frequent or not. <coughs> right? and similarly, for network data, you know naturally some IP addresses you know are more popular than others, like search engines uh, uh, and so on. Right. So, so you know at least in principle there is some data, uh, there's some information in the in the data, and uh, you know uh, if we have a machine learning algorithm that uh, can learn these patterns. Then potentially we could use them to improve the algorithm, and in particular, 
uh, we could uh, try to use it to avoid collisions uh, with the heavy items. Right? Because uh, if you have an, uh, some element and uh, uh, some very heavy uh, element collides with it, uh, this creates lots of error. Right? So if somehow we could uh, reduce the number of collisions between uh, uh, you know, heavy elements or heavy elements and other elements, then uh, you know, this would uh, potentially help us reduce the total error. It works not only with heavy items. Mm -hmm. For example, in the word example, yes. if you separate your hash function according to word length, yes. it also prevents a uh, collision between infrequent, uh, infrequent. words of length k and k plus 1. Right. So that's, that's true. Uh, unfortunately, the well, so yeah, right. So the, depending on the objective function uh, that you want to optimize, right, you you might either want to uh, reduce the collision between uh, two heavy items versus infrequent. Right. So for the objective function that now we are going to see here, uh, this seems to be the, the key issue. But uh, one could imagine, uh, like, if you wanted to have uh, you know other guarantees. Uh, you know, you could imagine doing uh, also that, right? Now, the problem is that in many of these uh, streams, uh, you know, vast majority of items are infrequent items, right? So th th they will have to collide uh, at some point, right? So, you know, we can detect it, but, you know, we cannot do anything about it, right? No pigeonhole uh, principle. All right. So, uh, so here is uh, our <clears throat> approach to put machine learning uh, in the... Uh, uh, in the hashing algorithm uh, has been is inspired by a recent paper by Kraska et al. on uh, learned bloom filters. And the basic idea is uh, to use past data, uh, you know, you know from, from earlier time or, 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 or so on, to train a ML classifier that attempts to detect heavy elements, right? And uh, then uh, we use uh, decisions made by this classifier, you know, to decide, you know, and we treat heavy elements somewhat differently. Okay, so in particular, here is the uh, flowchart of the algorithm. So uh, after we train this uh, oracle uh, based on our past data, then uh, given a new stream element, right, we run it through the oracle, and uh, if the answer is that uh, this element is not heavy. Then it just goes uh, to the standard sketching algorithm, like, like count mean. Uh, on the other hand, if this element uh, is predicted to be heavy, then we assign a unique bucket to it. Right? And by assigning a unique bucket, we know that uh, it's not going to collide with anybody else. Right? So, so this is the benefit. Right? Uh, this guy, you know, the heavy, heavy hitter, is not going to induce uh, collisions. Uh, but there is a price for it because, uh, you know, if you have to store things uh, in unique buckets, then, you know, we use more space, right? We, we need, uh, you know, space to store the hashed ID and the count. And, uh, you know, and of course, you know, we can, you know, if we store everything as unique bucket, then we are not saving any space, right? So, uh, so basically, there is a sub trade off. <coughs> and, uh, Yes. Can you compress this uh, like from two memory words to less using like compressed dictionaries or stuff like that, or it doesn't matter too much? Well, you need a count, uh, and you need some sort of ID, uh, yeah, but right? This ID probably can be. I guess your IDs are short to start. Yes. With. Well, the IDs are already compressed, yeah. right? So, so this like two words, uh, uh, you know, basically accounts for that. Right? Maybe you can get something like one plus epsilon word, but it's still like. So I, I don't know how to get one plus epsilon okay, word, right? That because they, they are, you know, multi-set, right? So you have to count, you have to maintain the count, and yeah. Uh, okay, but ma maybe maybe you can. All right. So so that's essentially uh, the whole algorithm. And uh, uh, you know, in the context of the intro to the stock, you know, the important thing to observe is that uh, this algorithm actually inherits uh, uh, worst case guarantees on the correctness uh, from uh, this algorithm here, right? Because uh, in the extreme case, if your predictor is uh, completely, you know, goes nuts, right, and uh, just start assigning unique buckets. Uh, you know, to LMS which are not heavy, you know, as long as you limit the amount of space that uh, uh, this uh, uh, unique buckets can take, you know, this algorithm uh, still uh, has some uh, non-negligible space, and you know, basically the whatever you, you uh, worst case guarantees you get for this algorithm, you know, they also apply uh, to the whole algorithm. Right? Basically, elements which are which fall here are estimated exactly, so there is no error. Elements that fall here, you know, have exactly this error, the same error as are induced by this. Right? Now, of course, uh, you know, it can happen that uh, 
you know, if you allocate a fair amount of memory here, you know, you, you cannot allocate this memory here, right? Which means that you will lose, uh, you know, some approximation, right? Your approximation uh, is not going to be as good, but still you have some uh, control, uh, you know, over the, the, the quality of the answer, right? Even if the oracle uh, goes completely nuts and, you know, just misclassifies everything. All right, so this is the, the, uh, the algorithm. It's uh, relatively simple. Uh, so, uh, you know, so the, the question is that, uh, how does it work? So we uh, did uh, two types of experiments. I mean, one type of experiments on two uh, data sets. Uh, the first data set is a standard uh, network traffic uh, data set, consists of uh, basically a bunch of packets. Uh, we looked at a one hour of traffic. Uh, you know, the data set contains 30 million packets per minute. We used the first few minutes for training. You know, just literally took the, 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 the this, uh, sequence of packets, you know, computed heavy heaters, and that trained the uh, machine learning uh, oracle uh, to, you know, attempt to predict whether element is heavy or not. And the rest is used for uh, validation testing. Another uh, set is the uh, American Online Query data set. Uh, you know, here, uh, you know, there's a bunch of queries collected over days. Uh, so we used, again, first few days for trading and the remaining for, for testing. Uh, this is the log-log uh, scale distribution of the frequency uh, uh, of those elements after sorting, right? So from the most frequent to the uh, least frequent, which is going to be relevant later. Now, how do we train this uh, oracle? Uh, we, we tried a bunch of things. And uh, in the end, uh, we just uh, uh, stuck uh, with the recurrent neural network. I mean, recurrent neural network makes sense for uh, this type of queries, right? Because you know they have different length, uh, right? So uh, you cannot say use uh, feed-forward networks. Uh, in this case, you know uh, they don't necessarily make much sense. And in fact, we, you know, in principle. In fact, you know, we, we actually started from uh, decision trees, and uh, we got uh, very good uh, results here. Uh, the problem with decision trees is that you need uh, lots of space. They're pretty big, right? So you need uh, lots of space to store them. And since you want to store safe space, you know, it kind of defeats the, the purpose, right? So in the end, we just decided to use the same uh, you know, uh, setup for, for both of them. And uh, last but not least, in the context of uh, your question, right? So the error function that we uh, try to optimize is this one. Right, so this is the average error weighted by the frequency uh, of the element. Uh, one way of thinking about it is that uh, you know, this is minimizing the average error if the elements are sampled proportionally to the frequency. Uh, right? Like the elements are, if the queries uh, you know, to the frequency are sampled from a distribution proportional to the original frequency. Right? Uh, now, if you knew this frequency, uh, and if it's diff if you knew the querying frequency, and it's uh, different than this one, you know, could put a different number here, right? But uh, you know, this is what we did. Uh, effectively, this this kind of means that uh, the distribution of the queries is the same as the distribution of the data, right? Which is a common assumption uh, in this situation. All right. So uh, <clears throat> so these are uh, our results, right? So here you see four uh, charts. Uh, two charts for uh, internet traffic, uh, two charts for uh, query estimation. Uh, for each data set, you see uh, one uh, chart for count sketch, one for count mean. And uh, the, most, the two most important uh, plots here are the blue one, uh, which is the standard count sketch, and the red one, which is our learned uh, count sketch, right, or, or count mean, and so on. So you can see that, uh, you know, indeed, uh, we can uh, improve the uh, trade-off between the space and the uh, uh, error, uh, sometimes, you know, by like a factor of two or so. Uh, uh, the improvement is uh, better for uh, this data set than this data set, right? So in particular here, you see that the improvement of the red over uh, blue is uh, fairly uh, limited. Okay. These, are, these are sample uh, minutes uh, from the future, right? Uh, so what are the other two curves? Uh, well, this curve, this uh, uh, orange uh, dotted curve, is uh, another, it's a similar algorithm, but uh, it uses a, a simple lookup table to implement the, uh, to detect heavy heaters. Right? So here the idea is that we take the whole data set, compute the heavy heaters, and only store a list of heavy heaters. Right? So there is no generalization uh, of any kind. And uh, you, know, you can see that uh, this improves uh, the space. Uh, but uh, not as much as uh, uh, learning, 
right? And we conjecture that uh, in particular for internet traffic estimation, this is because, uh, you know, often traffic comes from uh, fixed domain, but uh, with somewhat different uh, IP addresses, right? So what matters is the prefix of the IP, right? And, uh, uh, you know, the lookup table doesn't, you know, basically account for it, right? While the, the oracle can just learn to ignore the, the suffix, uh, right? The least of one bit of the IP addresses. Okay, and the last curve, right, the, the green one is uh, essentially a wishful thinking, what would happen if we have an ideal oracle, right, which are, uh, always uh, tells between heavy elements and not heavy elements, right? And if we had such an oracle, we could improve the space uh, even further by a lot. But, you know, of course, it's a little bit of a science fiction because uh, the goal of this problem is to estimate the frequencies. Right? So, of course, if we knew the frequencies, uh, we could uh, estimate them. Right? Now, it's not completely stupid because uh, this oracle just assumes that, uh, you know, that we know exactly the threshold, you know, heavy or not. Right? But uh, still, you know, it's not realistic, but it means that, okay, if we have a better estimator, we could improve things uh, a little bit better. And uh, this is pretty much all that uh, I had to say about the experiments. I should mention that the space here includes the so, size of the classifiers. Can use what I said before, uh -huh. that in many cases you can uh, distinguish in a finer way, not just between the heavy details and light details, but you have several uh, sizes yes. in your words, depending yes. on the length of the word. Yes. So in your analysis of the ideal uh, oracle, right. you might want to say that uh, you know in which uh, kind of uh, percentile sure. or yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's a very interesting idea. Uh, so we, we thought about it a little bit. We couldn't make it work so that uh, it improves uh, things. And there is some evidence that uh, it would perhaps surprisingly uh, not improve uh, things asymptotically, but uh, it could potentially improve the, the, the constants or, or, or maybe if you modify the algorithm, right? So uh, actually, I, I, will, I will talk about it in the next slide. Yes. Uh, but yes, I mean, this is a very simple algorithm. So in principle, I could imagine, uh, yes? So uh, to store the first, to do gradient descent for your RNN for the first seven minutes, yes. how much space, how much storage do you need to store, like the first seven minutes, how much storage is that? Like is it like a lot of storage or is it like the same? Uh, so this is, this is done offline. Uh, how much storage you need? I mean, basically, you need to, the, the most of the storage is taken by uh, taking your data set and just find the heavy heaters exactly, right? And then you just, uh, each element at this point becomes a label, and then you use as much, heavy, as much storage as, uh, you know, PyTorch uh, is using, right? So your point is that, you know, it photographies that space in the beginning so that in the future, like after... Oh, I see. So in terms of uh, deployment, you know, like the way I think about it is uh, you train it, uh, for example, uh, once per day, uh, say overnight, right? And then you use this uh, uh, oracle uh, for the whole day, right? Or, or, or something along this line. But yeah, I mean, like towards the end, uh, you know, training takes time, right? So yeah, at the end, I have a discussion about uh, cons of this approach. Yeah? So that's one of them. So, so yes. at least uh, I've heard many times that one of the motivations for like uh, such sketch sketches in the context of heavy heaters is to kind of like do burst detection or something like this. Right. So for like, uh, did, did you try instances like this or where actually there is some like unknown burst and which you totally do not learn during? Uh, so, so we, we didn't uh, uh, burst detection like in, in networks. Uh, yeah, like some DDoS attacks or something. Uh, DDoS attacks, like, yeah. Uh, so we didn't uh, look at it in carefully, and you know, in part because uh, you know our goal wasn't, you know, really to improve uh, state of the art uh, network monitoring tools, uh, right? Uh, our goal was to determine uh, whether uh, standard streaming algorithms can be improved, uh, you know, using uh, machine learning, right? And, and uh, you know, the reason for that is that, uh, you know, like once you start looking uh, at the very particular application, so, you know, we are using these data sets to test uh, the quality of the algorithm, right? But we don't necessarily, uh, you know, we certainly are not claiming that uh, you can use this algorithm verbatim, you know, in a uh, network uh, measurement. Again, I have a discussion about it at the end, but, you know, uh, there's a question of time uh, and, and so on, right? So, yeah. <clears throat> 
All right, so very quickly uh, about uh, our attempt to understand uh, uh, what is happening theoretically. Uh, so to this end, we modeled uh, the data, uh, you know, using the Ziffia distribution, right? That in the sorted order, the frequency of the ith elements proportional to one over i. Uh, this assumption is uh, reasonably true for AOL. Uh, you know, it's somewhat less true uh, for this data, right? Because if it was true, this would be a straight line, and uh, you have to squint a lot, you know, to to see a straight line here, right? Uh, but you know, it's a uh, uh, it's an assumption. Uh, and uh, we look at the counting algorithm, like in the later work, we also analyze count sketch. And uh, this is roughly uh, what we were able to show, right? So once you fix the distribution, uh, you know, you can analyze the count mean uh, algorithm exactly, and uh, uh, you can do the same thing for the algorithm uh, using Learn Oracle. Uh, so here in this table, uh, I, I'm showing the uh, analysis, assuming the oracle is perfect. If it's not, then uh, the, uh, basically we get interpolation between these two, right? Depending on the probability of error. So the actual formulas don't necessarily matter. Uh, what matters is uh, the difference between them, right? So you can see in red, you know, here you have, uh, well, you have two logs here, you have two logs here. But uh, here, one log is of n, and, the, and here both logs are of n over b, when b is the number of packets, right? So basically, this means that uh, in the high accuracy regime, uh, where this uh, n over b is relatively small, like n over b is the compression ratio, right? So the compression ratio is uh, relatively small. You know, you, can, you, you get improvement because this is constant, while this is uh, logarithmic. And uh, uh, this is asymptotic analysis, but, uh, you know, it, uh, it appears that uh, it does capture the, uh, you know, what is happening in this algorithm. I don't have enough time to give an intuition behind it, but, uh, uh, you know, if you have any questions, uh, please let me know uh, offline. And uh, I the one thing I would like to mention is that, uh, you know, here uh, we get actually a pretty strong uh, lower bound in the sense that, uh, you know, we, we show that uh, any even if you use arbitrary hash functions, which is completely designed for a particular data set, uh, as long as your data comes from distribution, you cannot improve uh, this uh, bound, right? So, so even if you have, you know, like, you know, th th did something more elaborate than, you know, putting some things in separate buckets and the rest together, uh, at least asymptotically, you would still pay uh, this uh, much. And th this is like a greedy type of argument, right? That, you know, if elements are very heavy, then you always gain by putting them in a separate bucket, uh, right? So, uh, all right. So I have like 15 minutes left, uh, I think. Well, yeah, that's right, maybe 18 minutes. 18, okay. Uh, Actually, I have a question. So oh, sure. if you start like varying, the, so if you consider other power laws with like other exponent than one, is the one the hardest? So is this different, the hardest case, or other, uh, other powers would be worse? Oh. Well, uh, we didn't do careful examination. I mean, if you have some other alphas, then instead of log n, you get some dependencies of alpha, right? So it would be like yeah. constant in this? Uh, it would be constant. Okay, sure. Yeah. I may want to uh, mention yes. another uh, uh, version of this problem in which the elements are not mm -hmm. chosen from mm -hmm. a random distribution, right. but from a pseudo-random distribution. Okay. And this often happens in cryptography that there is some uniform probability distribution with some peak. Right. You are trying to find it. So I published several years ago a paper at the crypto conference which shows that in this case mm -hmm. you don't need any uh, memory mm -hmm. in order to find the heavy heaters. Okay. Because you're basically using the fact that you can use the uh, uh -huh. Polar's row algorithm. And oh, uh, I see. the heavy hitters are those which are going to close the cycle. I see. Uh, oh, that's, that's very interesting. Yeah, Actually, if you could give me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just to uh, try to clarify that um, uh, we are assuming Ziffian distribution, but uh, in a deterministic sense, right? So, so this uh, stream here is not generated uh, uh, stochastically, right? We just assume that uh, after you count, after you compute the histogram, the frequencies, then uh, uh, this is roughly what, what you will see, right? Uh, uh, you know, essentially what this, what this says is that uh, the, in curve, in a plot like this, you know, you get a line of slope uh, minus one. Right, so that, that's the assumption, but you know, p p point is still uh, taken. All right, so I think that now my time reduced to like 15 minutes, right? Uh, 
16? Oh, yeah. All right, okay. Well, I guess, you know, counting, right? It's important, okay. Uh, so let me move on uh, to the second the class of algorithms. I'll probably uh, uh, try to speed it up. And this is an uh, algorithm for, the, uh, for a low rank approximation. You know, I'm sure that all of us know what it is, but this is just a recap, right? You have a matrix, you, you can decompose into a product of u, uh, you know, sigma and v, right? You know, u and v are ortho orthonormal uh, matrices. This is diagonal. And, uh, you know, this is a huge, this decomposition has a huge number of applications and properties. Uh, very often, what people do is, uh, you know, they take the, uh, you know, just top eigenvalues, right? So they truncate everything, uh, let's say, top k eigenvalues. And, uh, you know, it's a basic fact that uh, if you do it, then uh, you get the best uh, rank k approximation to the matrices, right? Let's say, with respect to Frobenius norm, right? And, you know, naturally, this is used for compression, you know, and, and, and many other uh, applications. All right. Now, especially over the last uh, couple of decades, uh, these matrices became pretty large, right? You know, recommendation systems and, and, and so on. Uh, so the standard algorithms start to get uh, somewhat slow, in particular if you just wanted to do, you know, like full decomposition to be n cube, right? You know, that's n cube is a lot. Uh, so instead, you know, people develop uh, approximate uh, algorithms. Uh, there are various ways of formulating approximation. This is one of them, right? So you still want to output the uh, low rank matrix, uh, but you don't necessarily insist on a minimum, uh, the best rank K approximation, but, you know, up to one plus uh, epsilon. And, you know, uh, it's reasonable to expect that you can do it uh, much more efficiently uh, than computing the exact K. And, and indeed, uh, over the last uh, 10 years or so, there has been uh, lots of uh, work in a uh, TCS uh, community and the uh, uh, numerical uh, linear algebra community and so on. Right? These are just some of the papers uh, on this topic. There's probably hundreds of thousands. Uh, many or most of the algorithms use uh, some form of a linear sketching, and uh, you know, if you want to know more, David Woodruff has a very nice uh, survey um, uh, about uh, the algorithms. And you know, it's uh, it's not just a low rank approximation. You know, there are many other linear algebra problems, you know, ridge version and so on that you can uh, approach using this tool. So as I mentioned, most of the algorithms use linear sketches. Uh, you know, again, this uh, sketch matrix, you know, can come from several different, can be of several different types. Uh, in this talk, I will focus on sparse matrices S, right? So it's mostly zeros, but uh, you also have a few no zeros, which are random sums. In particular, we focus on uh, one of the earliest uh, algorithm, uh, and this is a streaming algorithm, right? So it's not necessarily, I mean, it improves over, uh, in t of time, improves the time, but uh, it mostly focused on uh, improving the space. And uh, the actual algorithm, uh, it's not that important uh, because I will not really use uh, this algorithm, but this is just uh, for an overview, you know, how such algorithms look like. In the first pass, you compute the sketch, uh, right? The product of uh, your sketch matrix times uh, input matrix. Uh, then you, uh, you know, orthonormalize it. Uh, then you do a second pass, uh, right, to uh, project A on, on V, and then you uh, perform a computation and return the answer. So the main uh, thing that we need to know about this uh, algorithm is that uh, uh, all it does, it stores sketch, you know, SA, and, uh, uh, and then it stores A times VT, right? And the size of this is uh, basically proportional to M. M is the number of rows of the sketch matrix. Uh, so the shorter sketch, uh, the less you need to store, right? And uh, in theory, uh, uh, this uh, sketch length can be made k over epsilon, where k is the, the approximation that you are looking for. Now, technically, this applies to dense matrices, but I think something very similar has been developed for sparse matrices uh, as well. All right, so uh, how can we learn uh, this uh, sketching matrix? Right, so, uh, you know, so we are, uh, you know, doing the natural thing, right? So we, we take a bunch of uh, a data set of our matrices, right? Some sample matrices. And then we uh, 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 find the sketch matrix, which uh, minimizes the approximation loss, right? So this is, uh, uh, you know, the output of the Salos Clarkson Woodruff uh, algorithm, right? Which is well defined once you give it a sketch matrix and the input matrix. Uh, here is the 
you know, the, the, the original matrix, right? So what we want to minimize is, uh, you know, average over distance samples uh, uh, error. So this is a well-defined optimization problem. Uh, and, you know, if we solve this problem, then we can use the sketch matrix, uh, you know, in the future, right? As long as we, the matrices come from the same uh, distribution. All right, so, uh, so that's uh, basically what we did. Uh, now, this is a well-defined problem, but it doesn't mean it can be solved uh, efficiently. And uh, actually, we don't know how to, we don't have, like, a, we don't have a clever way of uh, solving it, right? So basically, oh yeah, I, I should mention that we use, uh, okay, so first of all, we use uh, sparse matrices. And uh, since we don't quite know how to optimize over support, right, because support is discrete, you know, we just choose uh, those matrices, the, those uh, entries, positions at random, we optimize the values, right? So that's uh, one simplification. Uh, at this point, uh, you know, the problem, uh, you know, it becomes amenable to, say, gradient descent. Now, we still need to differentiate this loss with respect to, uh, you know, S. And for some reason, uh, it turns out to be tricky to, to do in a PyTorch, uh, in part because of this involves uh, eigenvalue computation. Uh, so in the end, basically, we represent it uh, as VD computation as a sequence of power methods, right? And power methods, uh, you know, are naturally differentiable, right? So, so at the end, we managed to differentiate this thing and then just uh, run uh, stochastic gradient descent or, or something else. Do you have like one non-zero per column, no more? Uh, we have one non-zero per column. Uh, there's a question. Um, so all the sample matrices are low rank matrices, all right? Uh, no, they are not necessarily low rank uh, matrices. Uh, the, the, actually, they are not low rank matrices. They are arbitrary matrices. Uh, there are example inputs to the problem. So the ra their ranks are randomly distributed between 1 to 8, or they're, they're not meaning, uh, what I mean, meant to say, like, earlier when you said that problem needs to have some structure so that you can actually right. gain from logic the structure. Right. Uh, so, so maybe this, uh, this is going to answer the question, right? So what are the type of data sets that uh, we looked at? Uh, so we looked at uh, videos where each matrix is a frame uh, in a video, right? Uh, you know, this is example frame uh, from a, a logo video on, uh, on YouTube. Uh, we also look at the hyperspectral images, uh, and uh, this is a data set that comes in information retrieval, right? You know, uh, uh, you know, these are some of the details, right? So we use some of them for training, testing. We <laughs> optimize the matrix S. And uh, once we optimize the matrix S, you know, we test it on, uh, again, samples uh, from the same distribution, and we compare it to the performance of the random matrices. Uh, did I answer your question? Okay. <clears throat> All right, so, uh, so this is uh, the type of results that uh, we got. Uh, so here we are comparing the three curves. Uh, the top curves are uh, for sparse and dense random matrices. Uh, this is the curve uh, that we get for the learned uh, matrix, right? And uh, this is uh, as a function of a number of measurements for k equal to 100, and this is a test error in the log, log, sc in the log scale, right? So you can see that, uh, you know, indeed that uh, tuning the matrices helps, which is, you know, perhaps not surprising, right? Because, I mean, it has to help by definition. Uh, right, we run gradient descent, right? So it's a descent, not ascent, right? So, so it has to be better. But, uh, you know, it improves things by, you know, potentially quite a lot, right? So depending on the data set, you get a different uh, performance, right? This is for uh, tag, this is for hyperspectral, this is for MIT logo. Uh, not surprisingly, you know, MIT logo is a very simple video, right? So it's not surprising that, you know, there is some structure that, uh, you know, from a few uh, video frames, you can discover that you can use to optimize the sketch matrix. Uh -huh. so the fact that sparse and dense work roughly the same, that's kind of shocking, counterintuitive. I guess it has nothing to do with your talk, but... Uh... It has nothing to do with the talk, but, uh, uh, I mean, it's maybe not as... Uh, okay, let, let's, let's take it yeah, offline, yeah, right? Sure. Because uh, I think I have, like, only five minutes left or so. So, uh, okay. Uh, so, so that's, uh, you know, that's, that's nice. However, you know, still, uh, these, uh, uh, you know, these algorithms uh, do not satisfy our desiderata that are, you know, even if the prediction is completely off, you know, we still want to have some correctness guarantees. Uh, so there is a very simple solution, which is to combine uh, land uh, sketch with uh, random rows. And, uh, uh, 
you know, there are various ways of uh, uh, combining these two solutions, but uh, no, the simpler is just uh, literally combine them and uh, run it uh, using the same algorithm. And uh, here comes, you know, uh, and here we have like the only uh, lemma uh, in the paper, which says that uh, augmenting a random uh, set of rows with an arbitrary, in particular, len matrix cannot increase the error of uh, this algorithm. Right? So you can think about it as a sketch monot monotonicity. Uh, so the proof of this is really simple. Uh, but the property itself is not trivial because uh, there are other uh, uh, algorithms for this problem which don't have this property. Right? You know, the, uh, here, this property holds because essentially we're only using the kernel of the sum matrices. And, you know, then adding more uh, rows to the, to the matrix you know, just restricts the solution even more. Right? So, so, so you can you know, easily argue that you, know, you, you cannot increase the error. But it's, it's not a universal property for all uh, algorithms. And if you do it, you know, this means that uh, the algorithm inherits the worst case guarantees from R. Of course, you know, the fact that you are using some random uh, measurements means that you cannot use them for, uh, for learning, right? So, so you potentially can lose some, but uh, you know, still we, uh, you know, we did some experiments, right? We use uh, pure learn matrices, uh, purely random matrices, and mix. It's like 50-50. And you, know, you can see mixed are somewhat worse, but uh, not much worse than, than learned, right? Uh, while still you have some guarantees here, uh, you know, random, of course, you have full guarantees, but they don't work uh, as well. So, you know, it seems that this is like a, it's a pretty reasonable approach to inject some worst case guarantees to the silent algorithms, right? In this particular case, it's very simple. We just add a few random rows. All right, so uh, to conclude, uh, I talked about land sketches. And uh, uh, you know, two papers which show that you know, they can improve uh, things you know, for streaming uh, frequency estimation, low rank approximation. <laughs> In particular, you know, like I mentioned, that all of them have the fail-safe uh, options. Right? So you always get some guarantees. Uh, so we are working on uh, uh, using you know, this type of approach for other problems, and in particular, in a joint work with uh, 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 Ia and uh, uh, Ilya and Atal, I think all of which are uh, here. Uh, we have uh, uh, work on uh, uh, using uh, machine learning to improve locally sensitive hashing. Uh, we are also working on uh, uh, trying to improve the runtime of low rank approximation algorithms. Right? So, so far we know how to improve space, uh, but to improve runtime we have to improve more complex sketches, right? so like sketches from two, two, two sides. So, so we are working on it, but uh, it's still work in progress. And needless to say, there are lots of questions. Uh, perhaps uh, you know, uh, the main two are uh, sampling complexity. Right? So you know, there, are, there is a toolkit uh, for trying to figure out how many samples we need to, uh, to estimate things uh, as per uh, uh, Nina's talk. Uh, we haven't done it yet because analyzing this for uh, you know, eigenvalues is, is a little bit tricky. It would be also very nice to uh, minimize the loss function that I mentioned earlier uh, you know, professionally. Right? as opposed to just uh, try to dump it in PyTorch and uh, see what happens. And you know, the hope is that uh, this potentially has some clean formulation. Right? And uh, you know, maybe one can even optimize it with uh, some uh, guarantees. Right? So we don't, we don't have it yet, but uh, you know, we are working uh, on it. And uh, last but not least, uh, you know, just as some uh, summary thoughts, right? So, like the way I think about uh, using ML in algorithms is that you know it's a it's a, a t another technique, right? I mean, you have divide and conquer, you have a dynamic programming, you know, you have uh, uh, other techniques. So, you know, you could imagine ML or a course or, or and so on, you know, as being another tool tool in the alg algorithm design uh, uh, portfolio. But you know, one has to be mindful of the uh, cons of this approach, right? The pros that I focused on in the talk is better performance, but you know, there is uh, lots of cons, right? You know, you have to train this thing, which takes time. Uh, in the context of streaming algorithm, if you want to update, right, your uh, uh, streaming algorithm, you have to run a small neural network. If you happen to have a TPU or GPU, it's fast. If you don't, it's not, right? So, uh, and of course, you get different guarantees. Right, uh, you know, which are more learning type than worst case, unless you inject uh, some worst case guarantees directly. But overall, this is a uh, interesting, at least I find it interesting topic. So last semester with uh, Costis, uh, we taught a course at MIT. Uh, several people here in the audience were invited speakers, so thanks you for coming. The slides uh, are online, so uh, you know if you're interested, slides and. Uh, 
uh, scribe notes are online, so if you're interested, uh, take a look. And uh, last but not least, you know, we hope that uh, this type of uh, study will give some insights into classic algorithms, right? Because, uh, you know, uh, uh, that will be also a very interesting uh, outcome. And that's it. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Can you say again uh, the part where you have the mixture? You, you talked about guarantees. Uh, sure. Uh, for the low rank or for the. When you have this plot with the mixture case. Sure. You said it doesn't give up too much in terms of uh, performance. Uh, it, uh, well, uh, right. So basically, instead of an error being uh, 0 0.1, yeah. for example, here you get 0 0.2, right? But then you think, you, you, you think there was a hope to get uh, guarantees for this case? Well, you, you do get guarantees uh, for this case because, uh, uh, and this, this comes from the, through this uh, uh, lemma here, which tells you that, uh, you know, even if you just completely ignore your uh, land matrix and just focus on, uh, okay. So you definitely get the guarantees if you just use the half, uh, which is random. Right? Now, what this lemma says is that uh, augmenting random st you know, stuff with something else doesn't decrease the error. But that's okay. So it only goes, it cannot get worse, but it, it doesn't yes. tell you it will improve like you observed. Yeah, no, so this definitely doesn't guarantee about the improvement. Uh, all it says is that uh, it cannot be uh, much worse than, yeah, I guess this is for uh, uh, 20 measurements. If you put 10, it's going to be uh, lower, right? So whatever you get uh, guarantees with that 10 measurements, you know, they also apply here, right? So you get some, you know, uh, guarantees, but of course you don't get guarantees that you get uh, improvement, right? Like, yeah. like a random matrix, there's a in the neighborhood of that matrix, there's a good guy that uh, things like that. Uh, no, no, there is no. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So uh, when, you, when you towards the end, when you mentioned uh, that uh, you referred to this whole idea of uh, algorithmic design and embedding machine learning. All right. So what I want to ask you is, uh, you know, many of you in the field of uh, like theoretical computer science has focused on approximation algorithms for right. intractable problems. And right. you know, in that field, there is this sort of idea that you want to design an alternative algorithm mm -hmm. which will have some uh, approximation ratio to the optimal solution to the problem. Right. So is there hope of being able to develop similar results when doing machine learning? Because effectively, what you are going to do is you're going to optimize the algorithm and create a slightly modified algorithm that will work well on some kinds of data. Right. And um, this is what it's optimized for. Right. But when the data doesn't come from, when, when the assumptions are not, um, like when you have a different kind of matrix that doesn't come from the distribution, right. Right, right. then you will have error. But can you bound that error? I see. Uh, <clears throat> so let's see. So. Uh, so first of all, in the context of uh, uh, approximation algorithm for NPR problems, you should definitely talk to Nina because uh, that's uh, that's what uh, you know, she, like on clustering and other problems, right? I mean, she uh, she even talked about some of them uh, recently. Uh, uh, I, I think in the context of uh, using this methodology to, to machine learning, I guess the distinction is uh, you know whether you apply this to uh, machine learning to the training algorithms. Uh, right, so that's you know learning to learn uh, essentially, right? Uh, or whether you try to get guarantees for the uh, you know classification you get at the end, right? So class classification you get at the end, I, I don't even know how to formalize it because uh, you know if the goal is to detect faces, right? I mean it's not even clear what the worst case guarantees would would mean, right? Because you know this is not a you know it's not a total function, uh, right? I mean it's, it's it's not even fully defined, uh, right? As opposed to algorithmic problems where you know the functions were defined. For example, uh -huh. in the, in the SVD case, right? Like yes. the A rank approximation. Yes, yes. Let's say you collected a lot of training data, and right. in your training data, uh -huh. the ranks of the matrices were between uh, two to ten, let's say, or right. and n is large. Right. Now later we have done the machine learning. You have a fit model that has been optimized for that range of ranks. Right. But in your data now you have a matrix that has rank twenty. Right. So it's the performance of this learned algorithm will probably be worse than the original SVD method, right? Uh, it could, uh, it could, and uh, that's why, uh, you, you know, that, that's basically why we, uh, uh, you know, that, that's a ma major consent, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
And uh, you know, like our solution, and you know, there could be others, is to basically augment the sketch with some actual, uh, 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 you know, random uh, rows, right? For which, uh, uh, you know, there are lots of uh, guarantees, right? You know, as per uh, as per this book, right? So, so, so th that's basically our our solution, right? Because I agree, you know, it's a uh, there could be others. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.